within this last century or so are people who have contributed so much to society. It's a good feeling. They're hand sewn. Yes, it's all hand done. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tiny little stitches. It was said that this type might be used effectively for killing caribou. No more this and that. Hello, I'm Tom Murphy. Welcome to Land and Sea. For more than 10,000 years, the Mi'kmaq people have lived here in the Maritimes. At times, they have thrived. During other periods, their way of life was under attack. Now a group of Mi'kmaq are determined to build a cultural center to tell the full story of their people. And they're tracking down rare artifacts from Nova Scotia at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. It's part of their mission to connect with the past so they may protect their future. This is the oldest Paleo-Indian site in Eastern North America. Don Julian walks the land where his ancestors first settled. It goes back 13,500 calendar years. In archeological years, it goes back 10,005. Julian is the executive director of the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. 13,000 years ago, people were waiting for caribou to come up from the Bay of Fundy area. They would migrate up through here, up to the Kabakut Mountains. I guess this was a basic path for them to follow. So there were, our people are hunter, hunter and gatherer type of people, so they would have been waiting for their game to come to them. This was the main campsite, we believe. It was a hunting site. For many years, this land near DeBert, Nova Scotia, served as a tree nursery for the province. The incredible significance of this site was nearly missed. But then in 1989, a simple act of nature took place. One that would change the way Canadians understood Mi'kmaq history. A tree fell over, and in its exposed roots, they found Mi'kmaq artifacts. I started talking to my chiefs in Nova Scotia, telling them how excited I was. What we had to do in this area is to make sure that it was protected. Under the provincial legislation and federal legislation, this area and this land is protected under their legislation. Uh, we had to make sure that people, the general public, knew the significance of this site. We didn't want nobody charged. We just wanted them to know that this is a spiritual site of the Mi'kmaq people. So Don, the boundaries here represent roughly about 650 acres. From the roots of this fallen tree, Don Julian began his quest to use this land as a direct link between the past and future of the Mi'kmaq people. Over the years, with the help of many, he's put shape to his vision of building a cultural center on this land. So the entrance into the museum or into the parking lot is going to come through here? It'll just come actually down over to your, your left. It'll come and it'll wind its way through. So the idea is for us to... What my dream was to have a museum depicting our history to our children and for everybody in Nova Scotia and also the outside. Because there seems to be a lot of uh, interest in cultural understanding, cultural awareness, not only from Mi'kmaq but from everybody. Don Julian wanted to be sure everything on this site would truly reflect the real story of the Mi'kmaq. That led to the creation of the Elders Advisory Council. This council has hundreds of years of combined history. Julian relies on them as the essential source of knowledge. No more this and that. <laughs> Lillian Marshall is a member of that council. She lives in Chapel Island, Cape Breton. This is where she feels most at home and connected to her past. Chapel Island is one of the most spiritual places for Mi'kmaq in the Maritimes. It's where her people have come for hundreds of years. I started coming here when I was a little baby and we would live in a wigwam. My father would make a wigwam and you get up in the morning and you start playing, just like these little kids. Reminds me of myself. When you were here, 
You, 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 there's no worries. You don't worry about your children. They could run around anywhere. Everybody takes care of them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wearing uh, my great grandmother's dress, a long skirt. The top was made by my grandmother. The late been Christmas of member two, after he died, the family gave my father his Indian regalia because they were best friends. So this is what he's wearing. Lillian Marshall learned the importance of capturing and passing on the story of their people from her father. She surrounds herself with objects that have deep meaning for her. She sees it as her responsibility to share her history, which is why she joined the Elders Advisory Council. It will make the children, our, our children proud when, these, when they see those in, in the museum, our future, the Bert uh, Cultural Center, that's, that's where they'll be kept. The Elders Council meet at the Museum of Natural History in Halifax. They have an exciting day ahead. There is an extensive collection of artifacts here. These objects come from across the Maritimes. They're kept in the archives and are rarely seen by anyone. This is a unique opportunity to learn more through the collective wisdom of this group. Particularly with the textiles, some of the older photographs are really helpful because a lot of what's here is actually in a lot of the historic photographs, so we can match up. They already know some of the stories behind these items through previous research, oral history, and published works. And actually, no, this is Lone Cloud, Jerry Lone Cloud and his wife, here. And she's wearing this skirt. You can see this skirt over and over again, actually, because they shared yeah, it. The too. one skirt? Yeah. The one skirt, it was mm. beautiful. And it's made. in excellent condition. It's a gorgeous skirt. Yeah. Mm. Need it right now. Oh, look at the eating book yeah. that done. So, when you look at this... It's critical to tap into the knowledge of this group while there are still living connections to the artifacts. They're hand sewn. Yes, it's all hand done. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tiny little stitches. They appreciate this rare opportunity to touch and study these artifacts from their ancestors. And again, when you take a look at that, you can see that sort of natural part at the bend of the leg of it. Definitely natural. You just cut off the right off the back of the legs of the moose. At times, there is a real sense of discovery. I've been wanting to see one forever. Uh, now I see it. Honesk. That's why they call us Honesk in New Brunswick, because we, we wore these sh things. Honesk. What's the official spelling? G-Q-U-N-E-S-K. Maybe there's no T. There's no T. Coming up tracking down 80-year-old artifacts from Nova Scotia that ended up in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. In the summers of 1930 and 1931, Frederick Johnson left his home in the United States to spend time in Mi'kmaq communities around Nova Scotia. Johnson later became one of the most celebrated anthropologists of his generation. But those two summers among the Mi'kmaq were incredibly significant for him and the people he studied. He spoke some of their language and was accepted into their communities. He bought objects from them. And they also posed for photographs. He was convinced their way of life was coming to an end. So his unique collection captures a real turning point in Mi'kmaq culture.
Okay, thank you very much. Don Julian prepares for an exciting trip to Washington. Julian is the director of the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. He and a group of elders are heading to the Smithsonian Institute to go through Frederick Johnson's stunning collection of Mi'kmaq artifacts. It's an exciting time. It's exciting for me to be there and uh, see those. I've seen them in black and white, but now I'll see them in the brilliance. The collection has been stored in the Smithsonian for years, and very few Mi'kmaq have seen it. People have done a wonderful job in taking care of our things our artifacts and, and so on. But it's about time that we start doing our own collection and community people can understand and appreciate these. They are uh, open to uh, returning collections, but not on a permanent basis. They, they are looking uh, as a one year, two year plan uh, for us. Establishing our galleries at Mi'kmaq de Bert, we hope to you know, receive them for a 10 or, or more year um, opportunity at first. But the long-term goal would be to have those uh, return to the Mi'kmaq Nova Scotia. The Johnson Collection is considered to be incredibly significant in terms of what it reveals about Mi'kmaq life at that time. That's because Johnson was trusted and welcomed into those communities. He was born in Massachusetts in 1904 and made his first expedition to Canada when he was just 13. Well, his interest started very young and he was someone who was a boat builder apparently his entire life. He traveled by canoe, he built canoes, he built boats um, and he had spent as a young child a lot of time out on the land as we say and I think you know it just sort of grew from there. Leah Rosenmeyer works for the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. That wonderful picture he's got of the tripod and he's got a pipe hanging out of his mouth you know so you can see that lugging his tripod all over eastern Canada might not have been you know the easiest endeavor on the planet. In the 1990s when Rosenmeyer was working at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology in Andover, Massachusetts she came upon a small unmarked box. It was filled with the photographs taken by Frederick Johnson in Nova Scotia back in the early 1930s. She brought them back to the province to reconnect them with the descendants of the people in the pictures. The photographs for me changed entirely when I went to the communities. When we took those images back to the communities and we held community meetings with, with elders um, across the communities that he had visited, those were really powerful meetings because they stopped being photographs and started being people. I mean, I almost see the images as doorways that you walk through, and it's not just that you walk through to a time long ago. It's not really that. It's almost like you walk through to see the people today, and, and you understand better where people have come from and, and how related everybody is. Back to the photographic memory. I like That's Charlie. Oh. That's Charlie's wife. In the museum, everybody was sitting around talking about who everybody was related to. All the Mi'kmaq people are directly related to people in those images. That piece of sort of saying, we've changed a lot, but we're still related, that was a very, very important learning experience. And now, at long last, Mi'kmaq elders will finally reconnect with the artifacts from their ancestors. That's coming up. In the heart of downtown Washington, D.C., a group of Mi'kmaq from Nova Scotia walk through the city. They're here on a mission. They're about to explore the archives of the Smithsonian Institute. That's where hundreds of objects that originally came from their ancestors in Nova Scotia are now stored. 
They were first collected in 1930 and 1931 by Frederick Johnson. He was one of North America's most respected anthropologists. But very few people ever have the chance to actually see and touch these items. This is a rare and sacred opportunity for the group from Nova Scotia to reconnect with their past. They begin with a prayer. Over the next four days, they go through as many objects as possible. In each case, they start with what information is already known about the object, from field notes written at the time they were first collected. It was said that this type might be used effectively for killing caribou. It's got like a skull of shape here. Uh, it's, it's the front part of it here? Mm -hmm. So that represents the chief's head. Okay. Can you take a picture of the front? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 This is an old man. This is an old lady, this is an old lady, and this is an old lady notched on one side. It says here where it was made out of walrus tusk. Yeah. But these would have been soaked in everything from salt water to urine with salt as well to be absorbed into the wood to make it harder? It's a mat game. It's, in, it's very interesting because I had almost a cap like that when I was a little baby. They had, my grandparents made me a cap, and it was almost like that. <laughs> Maybe it's your head. <laughs> Maybe it is. Maybe it left in and picked the landing. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> Thanks a lot. The Mi'kmaq collection sits alongside those of many other native groups from across North America. There are actually over 800,000 individual items here. We consider that a large portion of our collection, if not all of it, is living, and that is really exemplified to us when Native people come here and make that connection themselves. We look on ourselves here as really just the stewards of these collections for Native people, and Many Native groups that come here or individuals feel that they can sense almost the power of the objects. They feel that the objects still are living here. So that, again, is another gratifying part of this job. While going through the archives, they're delighted and moved to come across an unexpected find from the Maritimes. That's a beautiful jacket, eh? A lot of the chiefs and the grand council members would have worn this type of jacket, right? Similar type of jacket. It sort of reminds me a bit of my grandfather. My grandfather was chief from 1916 to 1957, and his jacket's in the Nova Scotia Museum. Double V in the center of the oak was supplied by a Mi'kmaq woman whom he was visiting at Cape Britain and are said to be a special symbol of that group. So I'm from Cape Britain, and that, oh, that's my you? symbol. <laughs> so that'd be Unamagi. Unamagi. I'm glad I, I, I got to see it. It brings back a lot of memories. It's quite a history that, that we're seeing, you know, and it's a, to me it's a sentimental value to see something that far back, 1910, 1911, that one of our leaders would have worn. After spending days in the archives, they feel an even greater urgency to share what they've learned. I think we're responsible for bringing back all this to all our relatives. Gogomanach. Gogomanach. Imagine the school children. The Mi'kmaq Confederacy are working with officials here in Washington on ways to share these artifacts. They hope that some of these objects will come back to Nova Scotia on loan to be part of the new cultural center set for DeBert, Nova Scotia. That project will preserve and promote Mi'kmaq history and culture. 
Don Julian and Lillian Marshall reflect on the week that was and what lies ahead. I think our ancestors want us to be here. You know, that's why we got such good connections to get here and for all the cooperation. I mean, just looking at the items and touching them, even though we're wearing gloves, it's, uh, it's a good feeling. It gives me a great feeling understanding and knowing about within this last century or so, our people have contributed so much to society. The sweat in those uh, uh, hats, peak hats or regalia, uh, our DNA is probably contained in them. Our families, because a lot of our families uh, wore that clothes. Like my, uh, one example was my great aunt. She was wearing a peak hat. Yeah, and I'd like to have one made just like that. As they get set to head home, their long journey into the past continues so they can preserve their future. Hold on.